and welcome to the Nebraska Water Center's 2021 Spring Seminar Series. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm Jesse Starita, Public Relations and Engagement Coordinator with the Center, and I'm happy to say that we are now into the third of seven seminars. They've been great so far, and uh, just as a reminder, this year's theme is tributaries, race, justice, and the environment. So they all have that as a common thread. And you can watch recordings of all the seminars, the archived ones and the upcoming ones at our YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash Nebraska Water Center. I'm gonna introduce the speaker uh, today, uh, Dr. Marty Matlock, just a few quick housekeeping items. Just remember to engage in a little bit of self-censorship during the talk. So please mute yourself and turn off your cameras during the seminar. And then following the seminar, we'll open up the chat room to Q&A. Um, I think there'll be a lot of good questions that come from this seminar. So please post your questions in the chat room. If you're new to the series, you wanna learn more, go to our website, watercenter.unl.edu. Okay, I'm gonna jump in and just give a quick introduction for Dr. Matlock. So Dr. Marty Matlock is the executive director of the University of Arkansas's Resiliency Center. He's also a professor of ecological engineering in its biological and ag engineering department. He received his uh, PhD in biosystems engineering from Oklahoma State, and he's also a registered professional engineer and a board certified environmental engineer. His research focuses on technologies and processes to increase the resilience of ecosystem services in human dominated ecosystems. His focus is on the interface of food, water, and community systems. And his, his interdisciplinary work has been recognized by leading organizations in ag, engineering, architecture, landscape architecture, and sustainable design with over 30 national and international awards. And for today's purposes, uh, it's important to note, he's also chairman of the Cherokee Nation Environmental Protection Commission, which oversees programs, uh, environmental programs, and has the authority to regulate traditional areas of environmental concern for the, uh, the, the nation, such as solid waste and underground storage tanks, toxic and hazardous substance control, and water quality. So with that, I'd like to turn over the screen and the seminar to Dr. Matlock. Thank you, Jesse. It's an honor to be with you. Notice I'm wearing my Nebraska pin just for you, uh, for you guys. So it's an honor to be with you. What a great group. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to the PowerPoint presentation. You can ask Jesse for the PowerPoint presentation if you'd like. I'm gonna move through this fairly quickly. I, I believe that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So the way we avoid this, can you see my screen thumbs up? I, yep, okay, good. So you can see the screen. So I'm gonna move through this fairly quickly. And the, the purpose for moving through this PowerPoint presentation is just to share with you my thinking of, on these issues, but not to dominate our discussion. So uh, I, give me about 25 minutes, indulge me to move through this quickly. Don't worry about sort of the details because I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm going through legal framing and jurisprudence uh, as I talk about these issues. Uh, you, you can get these slides and I've got, a, I think, appropriately adequately cited that you can dig in a little bit and far, uh, find out more about the details I'm talking about. But I wanna main, mainly give you the context. We have to have the common language to talk about this issue about water and sovereignty. So let's see over here. So as we move through our, our discussion, we start with the recognition that we're, our, the context of our discussion is tribal or, or indigenous person's sovereignty, indigenous nation's sovereignty in the United States. Currently, if you look at a government map of indigenous peoples, this is what you see. Uh, the, the, the indicated polygons with colors in them represent uh, areas of land that are under explicit jurisdiction of tribes according to the federal government's understanding of jurisdictional allocation and within states. And then you see all the little red dots and lines with numbers and over 304 discrete tribal governments and jurisdictions, even though you have relatively small parcels of land uh, of jurisdictional control. 
This has been the understanding of, of the US government through most of the 20th, the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century until recently. But this is where we live. Uh, Indian peoples look like me, look like you, because we've been around for on this continent for we think over 25,000 years. Evidence is expanding that to maybe 35,000 years in certain parts of, of the continent. Uh, and we've been interacting with Europeans for 500 years or more. Uh, in some cases in, in the far Northeast, maybe over a thousand years of interaction with Europeans. So we don't look like the Italians you see in Western movies because we were never were. What we look like is a whole spectrum of people because we are a whole spectrum of people, 300 and over 300 recognized tribes, but even more um, and just we're, we're a diverse people as well. And 500 years of European exchange, the Colombian exchange, has affected us too. I mean, look at me, I'm half German, but I'm also a member of the Cherokee Nation and a proud member of the Cherokee Nation. We live on and amongst, on the land amongst the people. And we are rural people by and large. It's just, there are certain, certainly concentrations of indigenous peoples in urban environments, but by and large, we are rural people. In Oklahoma, where I grew up, I just wanna give you a sense for what it's like. So I was born in Pawnee County, which happens to be the Pawnee Indian uh, nation um, in, in sort of North central Oklahoma. Um, I grew up in Osage County, uh, but I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation. And my wife was born in Bristow, Oklahoma and is a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. That's just what it means to grow up in Oklahoma. It's a, it's a very complex interplay so my children are both Cherokee and Muscogee Creek, but they can only register to be members of one tribe or the other. And so you have to choose a tribe. And we are matrilinear, so my children are all Muscogee Creek. My Cherokee lineage from a tribal membership and tribal role number ends with me. That is the nature of what it means to be a, a Native American on a formal tribal role perspective in the United States. Um, where did we come from? A little background. Well, the Cherokee is a case study because I am a Cherokee. Prior to 1830, Cherokee Nation held almost 77 million acres in Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. And we didn't hold these lands by decree. We held them by warfare. We held them by right of, of, of conquer. Uh, and we fought very aggressively with our Muscogee Creek uh, uh, sort of competitors to the south and with our uh, competitors to the north and to the northeast and to the west all around. We, so these, these were lands that we held by conquer and by, by tradition and also by language and by trade. In 1838, Andrew Jackson, may he rot in hell, uh, but, uh, actually betrayed his, his, uh, his loyalty to the, to the Cherokee among others and forced removal, uh, implementing uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's final solution to the Indian problem, the final solution would occur, would emerge in hundred years later uh, in another context to the Cherokee problem, uh, to the Native American problem, the Indian problem as they referred to it and moving all Indians west of the Mississippi River uh, to that place that no one else wanted west of the Mississippi River at the time. Uh, and so there were a number, there's a boy, we could spend hours just talking about this process, but so the Cherokee Indians, as well as many of our other cousins, were uprooted and moved west. The President Van Buren gave the Cherokee Nation citizens land patent in fee simple for 7 million acres, which is now in Oklahoma. We gave up 77 million acres for 7 million acres. Not a great deal, but bayonets are very persuasive negotiating tools. So then we end up in Oklahoma. And this, these are the, uh, the Cherokee lands in Oklahoma uh, that we moved to. In December 1966, just to kind of continue the story forward, just so we zoom forward to 1966, 120 years later, the Cherokee Nation filed a suit against the state of Oklahoma over title to the riverbed of the Arkansas River through Cherokee country. Now the Arkansas River is this southern uh, boundary, this jagged river boundary that goes through central Oklahoma into Fort Smith, Arkansas. That's the Arkansas River, of course, Fort Smith, Hanging Judge, uh, et cetera, you know, the true grit myth. Uh, that's where that occurs. So the Arkansas River is a navigable waterway. And, uh, and so uh, 
Oklahoma and the federal government had co-opted the Arkansas River, but the Cherokee, but there's oil under that river too. And so we, the Cherokee said, hey, that's our oil. Um, we asserted that the land underlying the bed of the Arkansas River was ceded to us with the, in that land grant, which was a deed, the deeded land uh, by Van Buren. Uh, and in fee simple, we, it's ours. It wasn't a, a treaty, it was a, deeded to us. So the district court and the court of appeals found in favor of the state of Oklahoma, but we appealed and the Supreme Court said, in fact, the Cherokee, Choctaw and Chickasaw, uh, because we joined forces for this common question, in fact, owned those resources. And this goes to this question about why. So the United States Supreme Court closely examined all treaties in this applicable law which became Choctaw Nation 397 U.S. 634 through 635. In finding for the Indians, Justice, Justice Marshall said that treaties were imposed upon them, us, and they, we had no choice but to consent. This court has often held that treaties with the Indians must be interpreted as they would have been understood, as they would have understood them, as we would have understood them. And any doubtful expression should be resolved in the Indians' favor. So the Supreme Court concluded that the title to the Arkansas River did not vest to the state of Oklahoma upon admittance in 1907 to statehood, but, uh, but rather with the Cherokee Nation. All right, that's a simple finding. Now, let's, let's pin that on the wall for now, because that finding has significance as we go back and ask about water rights. So let's look, take a look at tribal jurisdictions and the challenges of jurisdictions. Now, I am an engineer, not a lawyer, so I'm zooming through this pretty quick. Uh, take a look at, William, at, at Joel Williams' work, The Five Civilized Tribes, Treaty Rights uh, to Water uh, Quality and Mechanisms of Enforcement, uh, and, and which you see cited below. It's publicly available. It's an incredible document, and I, and I borrow heavily from that. I would say, in fact, this is our lecture. So Joel is a Cherokee, and his work is uh, highly respected uh, in, in our community and legal communities. So we're gonna talk about a couple of doctrines about tribal relationships with the federal governments and states because we have this tripartite uh, jurisdictional challenge, federal, state, and tribal. Tribal jurisdictions over water is triangulated across those. Equal footing doctrine is the framing that courts typically view water rights conflicts between states and tribes from the equal footing perspective. It was first addressed in the Supreme Court case, Pollard, Lessee versus Hagen in 1845. Ultimately, it comes down to this. When a state enters the union, it enters on equal footing to other states. There is no lesser state or superior state. All states enter on equal footing. That's the foundational concept, as I understand it, as a simple engineer. Now, what that means is that with the equal footing doctrine is that states can't be disadvantaged if they happen to have tribes in their territory. That's the way the, the states interpreted that. Now, there's also the public trust doctrine, which is kind of in conflict with the equal footing doctrine. Lands would be held in trust by the United States government until certain conditions are met, and then they would be delegated to a state. With the exception of the District of, of, of with DC, District, District of, what the hell does DC mean? Anyways, DC, District of Columbus. With, with the exception of that, uh, every land area mass in, in the continental United States and in uh, Alaska and Hawaii are designated as states. Now we have uh, other, uh, areas that we that we hold, and we hold Puerto Rico, and we hold the Virgin Island, U.S. Virgin Islands, and even U.S. Samoa and other areas in, in these other states of I would consider to be legal limbo as protectors, but as pro but but ultimately uh, they are held by the federal government in in this public trust state. So although in, in Shively versus Balby, this the courts found that although the United States generally held title to submerged lands. And it's amazing how much conflict there is over submerged lands that uh, that seems to be sort of one of the places these things collide. Uh, under navigable waters and trust that for future states, which would take title upon admission to the Union, exceptions existed for an international duty or public exigency dictated otherwise. And a pre-statehood grant by the United States presented such an exigency. So they made deals before they became states and those deals for, with the federal government held. So now we have this sort of doctrine evolving to acknowledge that the states, the titles bestowed, bestowed by the United States during territorial period actually do carry over under statehood. So this is with white folks, it's not with Indians. Uh, so this is with Europeans, European descent folks. So that principle applies to indigenous folks as well. 
So now we have the equal footing of public trust doctrines, assertions that the federal government holds public land, domain lands, and resources on and under those lands in trust for future states. That was expanded to acknowledge that the federal government also may reserve land from the public domain, from states, which in turn does not pass to the state upon statehood. Now the Cherokee Nation and our sister nations, which are often referred to as the five civilized tribes, were granted ownership over land and the resources upon and under those lands prior to statehood without any intention that Oklahoma would ever be state, a state, that that Indian territory would always be indigenous lands. Those grants of ownership in their various forms, fee lands, trust lands, and allotment lands, all carried the weight of these agreements. So this was not something that was, was uh, given frivolously to these tribes. Now let's see where water rights ap apply because, okay, we're talking about land ownership and jurisdiction now and sovereignty. Um, now, what about water? Well, in the West, and those of you in Nebraska know this all too well, water rights really fall under a complex mixture of two primary doctrines, the riparian doctrine um, and, and the prior appropriation doctrine. The riparian doctrine says that riparianism limits the use of water to only those landowners with riparian rights, riparian lands. River runs through my land, my water. Uh, the, the landowner has the right to make reasonable use of the water course. However, downstream owners, river comes through my land from upstream, I have rights to that too. This means that riparian landowners may make reasonable use of water so long as it does not interfere with the reasonable use of a downstream riparian landowner. So this is sort of, uh, this riparian rights notion really emerged out of English common law in places that have over 30 inches of rain a year, places that were wet where you didn't have drought, where you didn't have water shortages. And so people could get along under these issues because no one was dying of thirst. But what, what's typically emerged because of even in areas with, with, that historically have not had water scarcity have, are experiencing water scarcity, what's emerged over the last 50 years is a sort of reg regulated riparian system where people get permits to use the water running through their land. And so those permits give them allocations. And so that's the way you spread out and distribute the resource amongst neighbors. And then there's the prior appropriation doctrine, which is the doctrine of the six gun. Uh, it's based on the first in time, first in right use where prior uses serve as the criteria for contemporary priority where the most senior appropriator has the highest priority and can, de can defeat all other less senior appropriators in times of shortage. This was the rule of water in the West. Water users can take water in order to use, uh, in order of their respective priorities with each user taking their own full appropriative rights until the water is gone. Most prior appropriation states have adopted a permit system, which modifies that sort of right makes, uh, might makes right, uh, I was here first, it's all mine attitude. Uh, but the, the, in order to activate these, uh, these permits, there has to be some designated, demonstrated use of that water historically. It's a major problem in California. I can tell you the reason you don't have meters on pumps in California especially in the Russian River Valley, is because once there's a record of how much water you use one year, you'll never get a drop more the next because that becomes a prior use record. So what does this mean? Uh, what rights do we, the, the, the community of, of, of folks who descend from indigenous folks retain? Well, the United States versus Wayne in, in 1905, the court examined whether citizens of the Akamaw Nation retained a right guaranteed in 1855 treaty to point, uh, point Elliot to take the fish, taking of fish at all usual and customary fishing grounds in common with citizens of the territory. So in this case, we had, a, uh, we had uh, water rights being extracted from uh, upstream landowners. The court concluded that treaty language from the federal government of the tribal nations only conveyed those rights um, that are explicitly enumerated in the treaty. All other rights remain with the tribe. So this is an important decision. I think I mean, I've skipped a slide here. Yeah, no, I did not. Let me, let me explain what happened. In, uh, so, in, so in this case, the Akama Nation uh, was, was, uh, was trying to assert their right to fish. And their argument was they didn't have that right because it wasn't explicitly enumerated. And the federal government said, no, when tribes in, engaged in, in, in a negotiation with the federal government, they, as the first folks here, had all these rights and any right that wasn't given away explicitly, they retained. 
So treaty language not, was not a, rights, a, a grant of rights to the Indians, but a grant of rights from the Indians. So all rights that were not granted from them were reserved to the tribes. This is a, a, a Winans was a, a critical decision at the court in 1905. Two years later, now we get to Fort Belknap Reservation in Montana, was being deprived of river flow from the Milk River. Folks upstream were damming and diverting the, uh, the water, uh, impacting the Gros Ventre and Assiniboine tribes. And so they sued, and under Winters versus the United States, uh, the United States sued in, on, on behalf of the tribes to enjoin upstream water users from construction of dams and other, uh, otherwise depriving the folks downstream of their, of their river water, which they needed for fishing and other agricultural purposes. The court found that reservations of land from the public domain for Indian homelands implied reserved rights for water. At the date of the reservation was created. So this goes to this prior appropriation notion. So that means that in 1888, that water was given to the tribes and anyone who came after tough, the, water, the tribes had it first. This is leveraging the prior appropriation principle to the benefit of the tribes. So now we have the winner's doctrine. So we have major findings of the winner's doctrine. The Indian, Reserv Indian reserve rights are cr creatures of federal law that preempt water law, uh, state water law, although they require an appropriation date to fit with the state allocation system. It's usually the point of the treaty. Indian reserve water rights arise from the tribe's original occupancy of the land. The priority date under rules for prior appropriation for tribal rights is time immemorial, if they've been there all, all along, but if they've been relocated to that land, it's when they were relocated. So in Oklahoma, it's when we were relocated 1835. Indian water rights are 1838. Indian water rights, as with federal water rights, are not forfeited by non-use. So you can't say, well, they didn't use the water, so it's ours. No, it's theirs. Uh, so disruption of junior appropriators of, is of no moment in determining whether Indian water rights exist or not. So this is a pretty absolute assertion in the Winters Doctrine for Western tribes. And it applies to you folks in Nebraska, by the way. So the Winters Doctrine and reserved rights creates this sort of simple framing. Rights not given up are reserved. Fundamentally, if you don't give up the rights, they are reserved. United States transfer of title to a state of lands compromising that particular state does not include Indian reser reservation lands. Indian reservation lands. Remember that phrase, reservation lands. So those are the basic principles. Now let's get back to Oklahoma, to my cousins in Oklahoma. Most Western tribes now reside on lands reserved for them from public domain lands destined to pass to particular states upon admission to, into the Union. That wasn't the case for the Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminoles. I didn't close my parentheses, sorry about that. Those of you who are undergraduates, I'd count off 10 points for that. So the exception was the five civilized tribes, which we hate the phrase, we didn't coin that phrase, but we call it our sister tribes. Anyway, so those, our sister tribes uh, from the Southeastern US who were moved, forcibly removed, lots of folks were forcibly removed. 38 federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma, for example, but lots of folks were forcibly removed, but we represented you know, from, from Florida up to Virginia, all the way west to the Mississippi River. We were, we were sent this way uh, at Bayonet Point with uh, a one to 10 re return on land pay and loss of all of the infrastructure we put in and I could go on and on. So anyway, so we've the trail of tears. So we get here. Uh, so the five civil rights tribes were never intended to occupy land that was gonna become a state. It was never gonna be a state. That was the whole agreement. And when we tried to make it a state in 1905 with the, when we tried to, to make it the state of Sequoia, uh, immediately, immediately the Congress said to uh, the folks who were in o territorial Oklahoma, you've got to make it a state fast. So then we had by 1907, 1906, we had a constitutional uh, committee and in 1907, Oklahoma became a state, uh, not a tribe. We never were a Native American state. We were not allowed to be. Hell, we weren't even enfranchised as citizens writ large as Native Americans until 1924. So I want to make that clear. So the federal government and the Cherokee Nation Treaty of New Echota recognized that previous amount of fee land was insufficient to support the rest of Cherokees moving west and settling upon it and agreed to convey an additional tract of land to the said Indians and their descendants in patent and fee simple. Language all the way through for the Western removal was fee simple land by patent treaty, I mean by patent title. Just like when you go buy a house, 
So this is our land. We had the deed. It's our land, our, all 7 million acres of it at the time. And then all the other tribes as well, with, it was their land. So this was not uh, reservation land in that, uh, in that it was held in reserve by the federal government or, or trust land held in trust at that time. That all changed, but that was where we were. The promise of the federal government to the Cherokee people was unambiguous. Here you are subject to laws in the making of which you have no voice, laws which are unsuited to your customs and abhorrent to your ideas of liberty. There, Cherokees, there in Oklahoma, Cherokees, you will make laws for yourselves and establish such government as in your own estimation may be best suited to your condition. These Cherokees in your new country, you will be far beyond the limits of, or jurisdiction of any state or territory. The country will be yours, yours exclusively. No other people can make claim to it, and you will be protected by the vigilant power of the United States against the intrusion of the white man. It lasted about seven years, better than most treaties. So then the consequence of Jackson's betrayal, Andrew Jackson's, the equal footing and public trust doctrines do not apply to lands retained by the five civilized tribes because we got the land in, in simple title. The Supreme Court concluded in Choctaw Nation versus Oklahoma that the United States reserved no property interest for itself that could be passed to Oklahoma upon statehood. It was all the Cherokee nations. This was in uh, 1970, the Supreme Court ruled that. Similarly, the Winters Doctrines that we just spent a lot of time laying out does not apply. We have even more rights within the Winters Doctrine gives us, gives tribes lots of rights. We have even more than that because the fee lands of the five sublimes tribes were never encompassed within nor carved from an organized territory of the United States. The chain of title of the land that today lie within the boundaries of Oklahoma, especially Eastern Oklahoma is unique, say the courts. The federal government did not obtain the land now uh, with, within the borders of Oklahoma in contemplation of forming a state. Well, lo and behold, well-intended, uh, good Christian folk in the 1890s, never, I mean, the most fearful thing is a moral senator uh, decided that they would they would take upon the the red man's burden, or they would take it was the white man's burden to carry to to carry the Indian, to to take care of the Indian. So Cong Congress enacted the Dawes Act. I kind of messed that up. The white man's burden is the phrase that the Dawes Act uses to 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 care for uh, the uh, the Indian who cannot manage their own affairs. So the Dawes Act in, in, uh, was in, enacted on March 3rd, 1983, or 1893, established the Dawes Commission to no, negotiate allotment, which is to take away land from the five civilized tribes. The notion was that an Indian couldn't manage more than a quarter section, 160 acres. Even though we had, over that time, we'd been in Oklahoma for 70 years, three generations, bought and sold land, accumulated wealth, built infrastructure, and then along comes the federal government says, oh, if you're an Indian, you can only own a quarter section. And we'll tell you which quarter section of that land you can own. And by the way, that's the way the Cherokee Strip and the land runs uh, were, were, uh, were accrued to the United States government to hand out to, um, to Anglo uh, uh, land runners, Boomer Sooner. Uh, so when the tribes refused to cooperate, and we did refuse to cooperate, Cong Congress passed the Curtis Act, which threatened determin termination of all tribal judicial authority and allotment if we didn't acquiesce, so fine. They said, we'll just terminate your tribal identity if you don't give us your land. So we gave the land. Uh, but when we did, gave that land, we didn't relinquish tribal water rights or mineral rights for that matter. So under the Curtis Act, no part of the fee title land held by the tribes passed to the United States, but instead passed directly to Indian, to Indian allottees. Thus, when the Eastern portion of the Indian territory eventually became part of the state of Oklahoma, the United State held, States held no water rights it could convey to the new state, Oklahoma. They were still retained by the tribes. The title passing to the Indian allottee did not expressly convey water rights either. They were retained with it by the tribes. So since the time of the five civilized tribes obtained fee title to the lands in the Eastern portion of Indian territory until the present day, we have always retained water rights and are not subject to ownership or control of any other government. That is legal jurisprudence. So we have more of a proper, we have more than a property right, but also a sovereign right to governance. As the Treaty of New Echota said, we can manage our own affairs. The United States hereby covenant and agree that the land ceded to the Cherokee Nation 
in the foregoing article shall in no future time without their consent be included with the territorial limits of any state or territory. Under existing equal footing jurisprudence, it is clear that the five civilized tribes have a property right to land within their territorial areas, which in turn gives us a right to regulate waters themselves. Now let's talk about water quality. So there's water quantity. So that's the one thing. We're not gonna take water away from people. We're not gonna to say to a city that is not Cherokee, you can't have water. We're not, we're, we, these are, we are the people, the people are us. We are the land and the land is us. There isn't, we're, we're Cherokee or not. We give more money as a Cherokee nation to our Eastern Oklahoma counties for schools and roads than the state of Oklahoma does. Even though there are lots of, I mean, most of the people live in there, 90% of the people live in there are non-Cherokee. That's, I mean, we are the people and, the, the, and we are the land. And so the people who live with us on the land are our cousins too. So we're not trying to take anything away. We're trying to manage it for better good. So while legal authority to, points to extensive rights by the five civilized tribes, there is no reported decision on whether we have bundled rights for enforcement of water quality. Why do we care about water quality? Because the state, frankly, is not doing a great job at managing water quality. In Oklahoma today, you will find that almost every body, uh, water body in the state is designated as unfit for primary human contact because of fecal coliform contamination. And they're okay with that, apparently, because they're not doing anything to reconcile it. I don't live in Oklahoma anymore. Um, probably never will again, especially after this presentation. So tribes can implement their own water quality standards once they have been given, oh, look back up. Several federal environmental laws authorize EPA to treat eligible federally recognized tribes as a state, that's treatment of state, TAS, for the purpose of implementing and managing certain environmental programs, functions, and for grant funding. Tribes can implement their own water quality standards for people who discharge wastewater and other and non-point source water into our tribal waters once we've got treatment of state status. This is a way we can navigate the jurisdictional difficulty between federal, state, and tribe is that tr the federal government would say, all right, we'll treat you just like a state. You promulgate your own water quality regs and develop your own NPDES permitting system, your own non-point source management plan, 319 plans, all of those things, we'll implement them with you. Sounds great. So Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma did just that. Followed all the rules, jumped through all the, the hoops in order to, to receive treatment of state designation. And they achieved that designation in 2004, 2004. 17 years ago. Um, so uh, they worked very hard. I mean, it took five years to get this treatment of state designation. Immediately after Senator Jen, Jim Inhofe, who 17 years, late, years later is still representing Oklahoma, inserted a rider in the 2005 Omnibus Transportation Bill that required Oklahoma tribes to receive approval by the state prior to getting a treatment of state delegation. Well, that'll never happen because the state doesn't want to give up jurisdiction. And the state has said from the beginning for 114 years that there are no tribal jurisdictions in Oklahoma. It has been the state's legal position since 1907 that statehood abolished all tribal reservations and all tribal uh, jurisdictions. So how do I know all this? this is, so this midnight rider that Jim Inhofe uh, put into the, the transportation bill uh, specifically says that Oklahoma tribes are, have different coverage under the law than tribes in other states. I would say that's a violation of, of the constitution, but I'm an engineer, not a lawyer, simple engineer. So keeping them down and never, never letting them up is the strategy here. Uh, the treatment of state debacle, that guy right there, Monty Matlock is my older brother. He is the director of the Department of Environmental Conservation and Safety for the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. He is the one who developed the treatment of state of, uh, regulations. He's the one who developed Pawnee's nation's environmental quality uh, regulations. The EPA Region 6 in Dallas has had Pawnee Nation propose regulations for water quality standards for 17 years and failed to act on them and will never act on them because they don't have to, well, they, they're supposed to, they're supposed to act on them in 90 days, but they're not going to act on them because if they do, Senator Inhofe will freeze their funding. That's the way politics works. Might makes right. Legal authority does nothing. Now, this picture of my brother's taken in 1912, just before the treatment of the state. You will not find other pictures of him online. He's probably gonna be angry with me for showing you this picture because after this treatment of state designation, the Oklahoma Indian, uh, Indian Oklahoma Independent Oil Producers Association uh, decided that 
they would go after him politically. And in fact, the FBI notified them that, that they had significant intelligence that he was his life was at, at risk. So he wears a, a bulletproof vest and never travels in, in the Pawnee Nation to do his works, do his rounds in the oil field where all these pumpers are pumping salt water into his creeks and discharging oil into his rivers and dumping debris. Uh, where he, and, he, and he's been very effective at, at, at finding them and holding them accountable, illegal dis salt water discharge wells, et cetera. So now he has to wear bulletproof vests and he has to be very concerned about his public safety because OIPA and Senator Inhofe fundraise on him. That's the way it works in Indian country today. Five civilized tribes are very powerful because we have gaming, we have money. Granting fee patents to us was intended to provide a permanent homeland for us. The preamble to the Treaty of New Echota stated the treaty was made with a view of reuniting the Cherokee people in one body and securing a, a permanent home. Federal court has never directly confronted the question of whether federal reserve water rights imply to enforceable water quality. Joel Williams, our author of this document, and many others believe they do. The Cherokee Nation is very hesitant to test this because if you lose, you lose. But because courts recognize that the setting aside of lands imply the reservation of water rights to support the designated land use, there's every reason to conclude that that includes water quality. The prior appropriation doctrine has been interpreted in some courts that a water right holder is entitled to water free from contaminants by a superior or upstream appropriator. The United States for Gia versus Gia River or Gia Valley Irrigation District is an example. So holding water rights is just an entitlement to an allocation of a specific quantity of water but not just that, it's also a, an allocation of acceptable quality of water. Polluting sources that are more geographically removed from waterways are really difficult. So we have sources that are within historic reservation boundaries and historic that out, they're outside historic reservation boundaries. And that's why we need treatment of state. And that's why it was developed. This distinction is necessary because tribes may exercise their inherent sovereignty within only Indian country. We can't go to Arkansas, where I live now. I, as the chair of the Environmental Protection Commission, the Cherokee Nation can't reach into Arkansas with jurisdiction. So that brings us to McGirt, 2020, fall of 2020. This one caught us, this one was a, a shock because this was a really a, a, based on jurisdictional claims for law enforcement and prosecution. Uh, and, and McGirt is an evil SOB. There is no way around. This guy's dirt. But this guy, was trying because of, of where he was arrested and where he committed his horrendous crimes, said that his, his prosecution was not constitutional. Five to four ruling finding with the majority opinion written by Justice Gorsuch, uh, the ruling held that the lands promised by the Creek Nation and extrapolation all five civilized tribes remained in Indian reservation, Indian country, because the state of Oklahoma said there are no more reservations. Now the Osage reservation has always been mapped out as a reservation because it was explicit in the treaty but the rest of the reservations were supposed to be dissolved in 1907, according to the state of Oklahoma's uh, notion about uh, entry as a state on equal footing. The court found that Congress never abrogated the reservations borders and the state has no authority to do so in a five to four ruling. So think about this. That means that the state of Oklahoma now looks like this. So after McGirt, these are the jurisdictions of tribal governments. These are the reservations of the five civilized tribes. Well, if you're governor of Oklahoma, this gives you heartburn. And in fact, it did. Because this is what Indian country across the United States now looks like after McGirt. Remember that first presentation, the slide I showed you. Now, suddenly, this is a 1914 map. It's probably more expansive than this of, of tribal uh, reservations. So the land is ours, transferred by fee patent from the federal government. The water is ours, confirmed by jurisprudence, precedent, and upheld by numerous SCOTUS decisions. The jurisdiction to manage both land and water are ours, affirmed by jurisprudence, uh, jurisprudence precedent, and upheld by numerous Supreme Court uh, rulings. Senator Jim Inhofe has blocked our treatment of state for the five civilized tribes. The Pawnee Nation has it, but we can't. The Cherokee can't get it. Now Governor Stitt, who's also Cherokee, has declared that he doesn't agree with the McGirt ruling. It just doesn't apply to him because apparently that's what you can do. So this is a quote from him in February last month. We all grew up learning in school that we didn't have reservations in Oklahoma. 
As a side note from this quote, I will point out that this was one of the arguments used against uh, uh, Gorsuch's ruling. And Gorsuch said, you know, what you believe and what's history doesn't really apply, or, or what's, what's told story by uh, generation after generation to, to family members and what's told, taught in the schools doesn't really apply to the law because the law is what's written down and, and enforced. It's kind of a silly concept, right? That just because your family never taught you this, that it's not the law. So what the Supreme Court ruling basically said that reservations still exist, it brings up, well, where does Oklahoma sovereignty come in? Well, I kind of just explained that. Governor Stitt, but and it took me three hours to sort this out. And I'm engineer, an engineer, but still, he's got a bunch of lawyers on his staff. They can figure it out themselves. This is not about jurisprudence. This is about political exercise of power. If the tribal sovereignty is elevated, then Oklahoma sovereignty is de-elevated. And I believe we have to we have to have one set of rules regard, regardless of race or where you live. And if we don't have a common set of rules of taxation and zoning, civil criminal, I do believe not believe Oklahoma can be a top 10 state. If we have six different sets of rules, depending on what county you live in, in the state of Oklahoma. The Supreme Court said this only dealt with the Major Crimes Act, the McGirt case. So that's my stance. That's his story and he's sticking to it. Finally, he ended with the Supreme Court has a new member now, Amy Coney Barrett has replaced Gittsburg, his disrespectful term, who actually was in favor of the McGirt decision. It was a five to four decision. So there's a possibility the court would overturn this and reverse their decision as well. That's not the way the Supreme Court works, but that's what they are banking on. So this is what we're dealing with in Oklahoma. As the chair of the Environmental Protection Commission of the, of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, this is, the, this is the context, this is the water in which I swim. Now, this has been a bit of a 43 minute screed in some ways, but it's really more than that. I will tell you this, we're gonna be here in 50 years, the Cherokee Nation, we're gonna be here in 100 years, the Cherokee Nation. We are prosperous. We are making our people prosperous. That is our goal. And the way we make our people prosperous is we ensure that we do not allow our resources to be exploited for the benefit of others, short-term benefit of others, and the loss of, of benefit of our future generations. The land is our people. We are the land. Thank you. I'll be happy to take some questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Marty, for that great presentation. A lot of really good background and history about Cherokee Nation and, and water law as it applies to, to indigenous communities. Um, I posted in the chat for people to feel free, feel at liberty to share your questions in the chat box. And I know we have quite a few students who are on this call and I'm expecting to hear from you all because last time with Doug Krogost, you asked some really provocative and good questions. So um, keep it up for this round. I'll kick things off. Um, man, I have so many things I wanna ask, but I, I don't wanna um, hog the time here. When we were getting on uh, the call before Marty, we talked a little bit about the ethics of forgiveness and why we got on this was our speaker last time around was just very measured and he didn't come across as bitter or cynical or angry. And I'm just curious as a, representative of a tribe that has been wronged um, throughout for, for a very long time. How do you go about managing that, that forgiveness? First of all, we recognize that, that, that what we're up against are really ideological boundaries, ideological challenges over resources. Uh, this is, so this is not a personal assault. The governor is a Cherokee, for goodness sakes. So this is not white man against Cherokee. This is so, so our, our, our framing is different. But I will tell you, the Cherokee Nation, like we're people just like every other people. In fact, most of our cultural ceremonies are really rituals about forgiveness. Our, our new fire ceremony, which is just emerging after the new moon next week, our new fire ceremony is one a classic example of that, where traditionally what every community would do, and we are, we're, remember, as a, as a people, we were really a collection of villages, of communities, and what would happen is during this new moon ceremony, uh, or this, all, all the communities would put out their fires, put out all the, the community fire in the middle and all the houses would put out their fires. And then the leader, the community leaders would start a new fire in the middle with, with branches of wood from representing each of the seven clans. And we would start a fire in the middle and then tribal community members would come out and put wood on that fire and light a new fire for the community and in the process of putting the wood on the fire, those are your grievances. 
you're burning your grievances from the past year because boy, do we remember. Boy, are we petty, just like everybody else. And this is the way the community would come together by having a ceremony of, of re rebirth, forgiveness, and renewal. The new fire ceremony, it's critical for our people. It's one of our core uh, ceremonies. And it's all about just quit holding a grudge against your neighbor and get on with it. We got good things to do together. Stop holding grudges. Put, it, put that thing in that grudge you have in the fire and let it burn and let it become part of our, our common strength. That's a powerful thing. Marty, I'll just let you field those as long as you can see them in the chat. Okay, so first is about the Colorado River Basin and how tribal water rights played into the reallocation of water. The Colorado River Basin is, a, is, is an absolute disaster in water resources allocation. And my cousins, the Diné, got the short end of that stick. And boy, did they even get even the shorter end of that stick when EPA contractors accidentally spilled a bunch of acid mine drainage into their sacred waters. So, and, and to my understanding, they still haven't been adequately compensated. So th that sort of um, um, process continues today. No, I mean, we all have re read Cadillac Desert. We all understand what happened in the West and the, and the taking the, of water in the West and allocating it to, the, to, to California and other places. These challenges are only going to get worse. Um, what we recognize is it doesn't really do you any good to sue for, for a remedy that can't happen. You can't take water away from the city of Los Angeles or, or San Francisco. You can't. So what are you going to do? We have to operate within the realm of the possible. And that's what we do. We try to manage our affairs and our, our, our strategies moving forward to enhance the prosperity of our children, not to fight historical battles. We don't have time for that. We are struggling, we are suffering, we are hurting, we are poor, we are dispossessed, we are disenfranchised, and we gotta fix those things. And we gotta fix them because every day is another generation lost. There's an urgency to our work, an urgency that demands optimism and not wallowing in our past. I gave you a history of the past because I want you to understand that the law doesn't help us. The law doesn't solve our problems because we cannot use the law as a vehicle for, um, for equitable treatment. Political treatment is what's going to help us. And that's why our goal is to become prosperous and to engage in the battle as equals, as co-equals for those who would take our resources. Now that's one of them. Uh, any follow up on that? Expand on the relevance of Winner's Doctrine in Nebraska. Oh my goodness. Yeah, um, you know, Fort Hall, Idaho and Wind River, Wyoming. I mean, the fact is, if the tribes have the resources to express their, their rights, they'll get the water. They'll get primary access to the water. And what will happen then is some sort of compensatory mechanism by other demands on the water for others who want it. And so someone's gonna have to pay them for it. And boy, is that gonna cause all sorts of other political upheaval. And so what happened in Oklahoma? The moment that happens, the moment the courts say that the tribes have that right, then Congress will intervene to take it away. That's what happened with Jim Inhofe and the Cherokee Nation. We had the right, the Pawnee Nation, Pawnee Nation, by the way, is a Nebraska tribe. The Pawnee Nation exercised their rights under the law of the land and the congressman stepped in and took it away without consequence. And it's still 17 years later is the law of the land. How do you reconcile that? Well, again, our colleagues at Standing Rock demonstrated one of the things you do, you build public support. This is a political battle. It's a battle of, of conscience as well as a battle of ethics. And those become, those enter the political domain. Uh, so that's, that's what we have to do. Now, again, we're not whiners. Uh, we're winning in many, in just about every front that we are, we are pushing forward, we're succeeding. Uh, and we know the battle and we're not naive. Goodness, we lost 77 million acres of land and we got seven acres, seven million acres of Western Oklahoma, our Eastern Oklahoma, which then got winnowed down even further 
to you know, just over 100,000 acres of land uh, through the Dawes Act and the Curtis Act. So we understand how this works. Uh, so what we're doing is we're buying our land back one hotel and one restaurant and one gas station at a time with casino money. We're building prosperity beyond gaming for our people. We, spend, we believe that only uncivilized people don't provide health care to their people. We believe that only civilized people don't provide education for their people. So we're showing the way, as always, we're showing the way, just like we showed the way in, in, in the, uh, uh, for democracy, we're showing the way here. All right, let's see. The Winnebago tribe in Nebraska's application for a treatment of state uh, and late in the air. So, so Katie, why don't you tell us what's going on there? I'm, I'm, this is a conversation. Oh, it was approved. That's good. But Katie, tell us what's going on there, because I think that's an important, relevant discussion. I hate to put you on the spot and you don't have to if you don't want to. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can speak a little bit to what I know about it. Um, I'm just I'm a poet and I'm from Georgia and I'm working on a yeah a creative project about the history. But my understanding is that um, the Army Corps of Engineers dammed the Chattahoochee in 1956 and then, you know, bought out roughly 700 families at unfair costs and it's just changed the entire ecological landscape of Georgia and of course like um, indigenous burial sites, you know, everything that you can imagine. Um, yeah, so, my, yeah, this, my Cherokee yeah. ancestors were from northern Georgia, by the way, but oh, look okay. at what the Tennessee Valley Authority did as well. The Tennessee Valley Authority. Now the good news is by submer submerging our historical homelands there in, in, in some ways in a time capsule under reservoirs because they're underwater. Uh, and so they're not subject to pot theft or to, to, to grave stealers anymore. So in some ways that's good. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, 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 here's the thing. There are these injustices and they, and they are the, the sort of the, they paint across the American tableau, these injustices. And it's not just Afri Native Americans, it's African Americans. It's our Hispanic brothers and sisters who are struggling for identity and access to our promise of freedom and, and prosperity as well. How do we collectively reach that higher land, that, that greater good? What we have to do is acknowledge where our weaknesses are and we've got to be strong. We've got to be disciplined. We don't have time for self-pity. We don't have time for wallowing in the past. What we have to do is learn from the past and not be fools, not expect that which is, un, which is unreasonable. Do not expect that the law will protect us. The law will give us leverage for political action. And that's the best we can hope for. So, I mean, this, this is not a naive sense of what we are. This is hardcore, hard bit democracy. And we are all in, we know how it works. Let me tell you, tribal governments for, uh, uh, forgive and remember. Uh, I mean, we, we, just, we just keep moving, right? Um, so it, it's a hard thing uh, to, to, we understand this, this tension and we're not, we're not put off by it. Uh, we believe we're up to the fight and we're building our infrastructure to be more effective at it. But until, and until we can control our resources, we're in trouble. Until we control our resources, uh, then we, are, we have everything we're doing is at risk. Some of the spiritual and tribal beliefs about water represents the tribal nations. Oh my, it's, I mean, it, there is a core found, there's a foundational belief amongst all Stone Age people, and that includes North American Stone Age people, all people who live on the land with the land and who are connected to the seasons in a daily rhythm, that water is the blood of life, that water is everything. We're a hydraulic species. Uh, we live on, near, or, or, or the water because we have to. And so, uh, and, and for Stone Age species where you didn't, even Stone Age species, by the way, had major navigation or major irrigational channels, diversion channels. We brought water to the, to in Central and South America into the plains of the desert. Uh, and so it's not like we're not sophisticated to be clear. We just hadn't developed the steel technology. We're building, working on copper when the when Columbian exchange occurred. Uh, we had copper well in hand, we were working on steel, but we hadn't developed steel yet. But because of all of that, that means that we lived in close proximity to the land, in the rhythms of the land, and we read the land very well, or you didn't survive. And so that's the, so, so there is no, I mean, 
water is part of the Cherokee belief, uh, origin story. We emerged when the water beetle swimming in a water in a pond in a cave. So a cave, uh, we were in a, all the beginning of life was uh, was water and a pond or a pool in a cave, a top. Um, and the water beetle swam into the down into the mud and picked up mud and brought it up to the surface. And that's where the land came from. So our origin story is in the water and the, the relationship of water and the land. So absolutely, it's core to our essence. Uh, every every um, indigenous community has its rituals that are associated with water. Ours are no different. They're cleansing. Um, and they're also re uh, about rebirth. Uh, so again, I, wanna, I don't want to presume to be mystical here because I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm not an elder. I don't know the elder ways. Very few of us do. I have a graduate student, by the way, who's becoming who's an elder in the making. Uh, she's working with the Cherokee Young Elders Program, learning the language, learning, learning the rituals, and learning the traditions. Those are critical, and we're trying to do that across all of our communities. All right. Also, uh, yeah, the, Dr. Ray, you're at the University of Hawaii. Yes. So is, is Oklahoma more economical than, uh, let's see, is, uh, is the Oklahoma issue more economic than it is prevention of a reasonable resolution? Oh, it's all economic. I mean, he, Oklahoma has been following Texas and, and cutting taxes for corporations, cutting taxes for corporations. That's why they had to furlough their schools two years ago before COVID, they had to furlough their schools because they had no tax base. So what did they do? They wanted to come in and take Cherokee and Creek and Muscogee and, and Choctaw. They wanted to take tribal monies through renegotiating the tribal gaming compacts. The tribal gaming compacts were paying taxes on revenues, but they wanted more. They wanted corporations to pay less, tribes to pay more. That sort of regressive taxation process I find to be offensive. It's that simple. This is where we are. There's a point where the people, where we have to make a decision as a people about those things that we value and those things that we want to, to work to assert. And so this is where it becomes political. Dr. Ray, by the way, I'm working with our, with our colleagues at, at, uh, at the Hawaiian Community Colleges to create listening circles um, over this with an EPSCOR project over the next six months uh, so that we can bring our faculty with tribal elders so our faculty can better understand the issues that we're facing, that, are, that our tribal communities are facing. Because our faculty, especially faculty leadership, really don't understand. So I had a colleague there, uh, Cayo Duarte, who left uh, the university and he became, uh, he's now on, one of the vice presidents of the trust, uh, Kamehameha School. So if you need connectivity with him, let me know. I work with Kamehameha School very closely, incredible school system, yes, but Certainly, let's 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 circle back. Real quickly, I think we're out of time, but I can tell you something about listening circles. Listening circles are an old tribal tradition. You guys learned about them in kindergarten when you got the talking stick, because that's what we do. Uh, yeah, much of what's much of common culture in the United States derives directly from our Eastern Woodland communities and their cultures. Um, so, the, but the listening circles are opportunities for people to come together about an issue. And there is a fundamental rule: you do not talk, you do not talk until you're invited to talk. Now, the host, if a good, if a good host, will invite everyone to talk. But you're invited to speak, but otherwise you're there to listen. And if you're there for eight hours, this is the old school way, and you never say a word, that's a good day. Uh, because that means you have learned. So there's an ethic of the listening circle, which is that I am there to listen and engage others through my presence, not through my voice. Now, that concept is <laughs> very anti-German. <laughs> so, I mean, half of me is just rails against it, as you can tell. But I have my father, my father who just passed away last year, my Cherokee side of my family, uh, would, had, had, had a stroke 12 years ago and couldn't speak anymore. And, and we teased him frequently that 
You know, we didn't tell the difference because we would go for days. We drove from Fayetteville, Arkansas to, uh, to Augusta, Florida. My brother and my dad and I did. And I bet my dad said five words in the entire trip. He was fully engaged with us in our conversations, fully engaged, but words were not part of his engagement. Words were not necessary. Think about what happens if we get to a point where we can engage with each other for hours without saying anything. Because we're looking, we're intent, we're, 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 we're engaging in intention. Now it's hard to do in an academic setting, but walking through the woods, uh, just participating in whatever we do in our daily lives, where words no longer become the vehicle for communication, but your body language is the dominant vehicle. So we're, this, is not a, this is not a mystical thing to do either, but that's what we're, we're engaging in listening circles. I can tell you the Western culture does not abide them very well, but we're gonna do the best we can. Well, I think this is a good note to, to wrap up on. And if everybody could join me, everybody who's, uh, who knows where your emoji button is now, I'm sure that's probably everybody. If you would just give uh, Marty, join me in giving Marty a little hand clap. Uh, great, great words, um, great positive communication during the Q&A too on just things that, um, that, that the Cherokee Nation can do, but also that we as, as citizens of America can can do. Um, and so just before signing off, um, I'd like to again thank uh, Marty just taking the time out. Clearly you're you're really busy in all of your activities in life. So we do really appreciate that. Thank you all for joining um, as guests and mark your outlooks and your Googles or whatever calendars you have for our next seminar, Wednesday, March 17th. So two weeks from today at, again at 3.30 PM. We'll have Professor Rebecca De Jesus. She's an assistant prof in the Department of Environmental Sciences at LSU. So kind of continu continuing the South or South Central theme. She'll be talking about linkages between ecosystems and human health with a focus on her studies along coastal Puerto Rico. So spring break to, <laughs> to Puerto Rico. Um, check our YouTube in the next few days. We will have a recording of this talk. And I think with that, I'd just like to say thanks again, Marty. Goodbye, everyone. It's my pleasure. It's an honor. See you folks soon. Wado in the Cherokee language. Wado.